This is session 10, Beholding the God of Power. And I want to open with 1 Chronicles 29, 11 to 13, prayer of David, as he gave offerings for the future temple that his son Solomon would build. And this is a portion of David's prayer. Thine, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty for all that is in the heaven and in the earth is thine. Thine is the kingdom, O Lord, and thou art exalted as head above all. Both riches and honor come of thee, and thou reignest over all, and in thine hand is power and might, and in thine hand it is to make great and to give strength unto all. Now therefore, our God, we thank thee and praise thy glorious name. Isn't this wonderful what David is saying when we're talking about power? He said, you are the one with power and might, and you are the one who gives strength to all. The God of power gives us the power, the strength we need. Back in 1981, Rabbi Harold Kushner published a best-selling book at that time called When Bad Things Happen to Good People. And uh, Rabbi Kushner was trying to make some sense out of some tragedy in his own life. And he felt like he was at a dilemma that either God was good and not powerful enough to keep tragedy from happening, or God was powerful but not good enough to do it. And he said they both can't be right, that God is both good and powerful. Well, what is missing there is what mercy is. Mercy is, is, is rescuing us from our most miserable condition, and that's always going to be a spiritual situation. But he came down on the side that God was good. He didn't want to let go of that, but that God was somewhat limited in his power. There are just some things he couldn't do. That's not the God of the Bible. Listen to a, a different viewpoint from Stephen Charnock. He said, The power of God is that ability and strength whereby he can bring to pass whatsoever he pleases. Now, isn't that a blessing? That God can bring to pass whatever he pleases. I'm glad he can do everything he wants to do. I, I would hate to be around if God were frustrated in some way. You know, what, you know I, I mentioned before to you what, you, what if God woke up in a bad mood? Or God had a bad day? God doesn't have bad days. And he can always bring about whatever he wills. That's a wonderful thing. He can bring to pass what, whatsoever he pleases, whatsoever his infinite wisdom may direct, and whatsoever the infinite purity of his will may resolve. As holiness is the beauty of all God's attributes, so power is that which gives life and action to all the perfections of the divine nature. How vain would be the eternal counsels his deliberations and his, and his decisions, if power did not step in to execute them? What if he could think about all these wonderful things but couldn't do them? Without power, his mercy would be but feeble pity. His promises, empty sound. And his threatenings, a mere scarecrow. Not real at all. God's power is like himself. Infinite, eternal incomprehensible. It can neither be checked, restrained, nor frustrated by the creature. Now that's a great blessing. God can do whatever he wills to do and whatever his divine wisdom says is best, his divine love says is best, and all of those things working together and God can always fulfill what he pleases to do. That's a wonderful thing. And he's our father and loves to work on the behalf of his children to make us to become like him. That God has all power means that he possesses absolute might. Absolute might. The New Testament word for that is dunamis. It's where we get the word dynamite. It means power or ability, physical or moral, as residing in a person or thing. It means that he is able. One summer, I was working on a message that I preached on a ministry team and and I, I really got hold of this, this concept in the scripture of he is able. And I began tracing those, those passages through the Bible. And there are so many wonderful passages where he says he is able, 2 Corinthians 9, 8. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you 
so that you always, having all sufficiency in all things, can abound to every good work. In Ephesians 3.20, Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. In Romans 4, 20 and 21, about Abraham, he staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God and being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able also to perform. Now, folks, this is a wonderful thing. Whatever he promises, he can, and he can do because he's powerful, and he will do because he's faithful. Some, uh, a couple of Christmases ago, my wife... Uh, bought me a, a painting of Simeon holding the Messiah. I cannot tell you. I had just finished doing that study about, um, about the, the prophecy of God. I cannot tell you how overwhelmed I was that Christmas morning looking at that painting because I had just seen this man holding in his son, in his hands, the promised one. Not only was God faithful to bring this to pass, but he had the power to do it. Folks, this is our stability, that we have this kind of God who resides in us, who has delivered us, who has saved us, who is working in us. This is the kind of God we have. There's no room for our instability, except that we don't know God well. And I tell you, I, that when, when I saw that, I, that, that, that portrait is hanging in our, in our family room, and I tell you what, there's a promise coming one day that is just as real to me as the Messiah was to him, and that is that Jesus Christ is coming again. Amen. Why? Because he said he would. And because he can do it. He is able the promises of God will not mean much to you unless you understand his faithfulness and his power to bring about everything he said he would. 2 Timothy 1.12, that's what caused Paul to say, I know whom I have believed, and I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. Hebrews 7.25, wherefore he is able to save them to the uttermost that come unto God seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. Jude 24, I pray this often for myself and for the university family, for the people I love now unto him that is able to keep you from falling. He is able. We don't have to mess up, folks. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before his throne with exceeding joy. He is the only wise God. He's able to do that. We see his power in creation. I, I, I love Isaiah 40. Some wonderful, wonderful things in here. Isaiah 40, 12. It says, Who hath measured the waters in the hollow of his hand and meted out heaven with a span. Like God says, How big am I going to make heaven? A span is about three hand widths. God said, Oh, all right. Oh, we'll make heaven about that big. Okay, there's heaven. I mean, this is no big thing for him. This is power, folks. Measured out the heavens with a span, comprehended the dust of the earth in a measure, and weighed the mountains in scales and the hills in a balance. This is a powerful God who can do all of that. I say sometimes, if you think you have power, just try to get your cat to come in at night. <laughs> Find out you don't have any power at all in your words. But he has power in his. He says it, and it happens. That's power. That is amazing power. I love what uh, A.W. Tozer says about Isaiah 40, 26. He says, lift up your eyes and behold, who hath created these things? Talking about the stars. That bringeth out their host by number. He calleth them all by names, by the greatness of his might, for that he is strong in power, not one faileth. And Tozer said, here is, here is a wonderful imagery of the great shepherd of the heavens leading his flock of stars. He's named all of them and he's leading them across the sky and not one of them fails. And he says men can point learnedly their, their glasses, talking about telescopes, at the stars and gaze learned and talk learnedly about them, but all they're doing is counting God's sheep. That's right. He put them all out there. He knows them all by name. 
He, he, he leads them every day across the sky and back. That's power to make that happen. I remember some years ago, I was speaking out in a uh, uh, Christian school conference out in Hawaii, and I'd never been on Hawaii before. And um, my host, um, the next day, uh, took me on a hike up to the top of Diamond Head Mountain. It's an extinct crater. And um, yeah, I look out, and, and I'm, I'm from South Dakota. I'm not used to oceans. We have waves of golden grain, you know, that kind of thing. And that's about, that's about it for waves, and you don't surf those. And um, I'd flown over in the middle of the night, so I really hadn't seen all this. But I stood on top of that mountain. I looked around, and I thought, this, this is a lot of water. It's a lot of, I mean, a lot of water. And then my host, he pointed out, he said, see that right down there? See where those, those boats are out there? You look in a little bit, and it turns green right there. And, all right, right at that point, and he showed me a line. He said, that's where the tide comes into. And the tide was way out. And I thought, this, you know what's even more amazing? God moves all of that water back and forth. And I thought, you know, when the girls were little, we had this little kiddie pool in the backyard about, you know, four or five feet around and three blow-up rings high. You know, and you fill it with a garden hose, and you can only leave it in place for about three days, and then you got to move it, or it'll kill the grass. And I'm out there sweating and pulling. I'm trying to move that kiddie pool just, you know, a couple of feet. And it takes all I can do to do that. And God moves all of the oceans back and forth. And I say this reverently, and he doesn't even sweat. You know why? He does that with the word of his power. That's amazing power. That's the power to bring about every promise he has made. That's the power to rescue us from our miserable conditions. I remember shortly before that, when I was, met, when I was thinking about these things, standing on top of that mountain, I had seen a news uh, clip of, a, of some movie that they were making at that time, and and uh, on this news clip, they, were t they, they showed this pond. The, the, part of the movie was, a, was some big storm, ship at sea. And, and they showed this pond they had made to recreate a storm. And they had these big hydraulic paddles going back and forth. All kinds of hydraulics and engineering that had to go into that thing creating this storm. And the mechanism was just astonishing. And I stood there on Diamond Head and I thought, you know when God wants to whip up a storm... He didn't need all these hydraulics and all these big, huge paddles. He just gives the word, and it happens. That's power. And that is the power behind every promise he has made. He's able, folks. Genesis 1, and God said, let there be light, and there was light. That's power. We see his power in preservation. We call his preserving power providence. The way he sustains his creation and works out various things. Did you know that the weather is not just a matter of low and high pressure systems? It's a matter of the word of the living God. I had somebody ask me one time, do you, you think God is behind every storm, every earthquake? I said, absolutely, he's behind every one of those. That's his power in creation and his power in providence. And, you know, we used to have a sense of this. We even used to call natural disasters what? Acts of God. Because that's exactly what they are. Acts of God. That's true for our physical afflictions. That is true for our birth defects. That is true for cancer. That is true for disabilities. It is true for accidents, it is true for disease, it is, it is true for conception, it is true for death. They are all acts of God. You know, his providence is, isn't limited to good things, but in traumatic things as well. Everything that he does, everything that happens, he does. I like what Jerry Bridges says about this. He says, Christ is the originator and the upholder of the universe. In him it consists or holds together from hour to hour. The steady will of Christ constitutes the law of the universe and makes it a cosmos instead of a chaos, just as his will brought it into being in the beginning. 
You know, if God were to suspend his word, his providential word of sustaining all of us, we would all fly back into the nothingness from which we, made, from which we came. We are held together by the power of God. We see his power in government, and boy, is that a blessing. And when we look around, we think this whole place is a mess, and it is. But God hasn't lost control of it. Romans 13, 1 to 2, very convicting verses my freshman year at Bob Jones. I'd lived a pretty free life at home the last year against my parents' wishes my senior year of high school, and I came to Bob Jones. And I had, I had promised my parents in a weak moment that I would go to a Christian college for a year. And so in my pride, because I didn't want to go back on my promise, I went to Bob Jones to do my one-year time in that maximum security facility. <laughs> and when I was paroled, I was going to get out and do what I wanted. You know what I underestimated? The power of God. The power of his word to reach into my heart and convict me of my sin and turn me around. And he taught me a lot of things because I, I fussed about some of the rules because I didn't, I didn't like to do certain things. And God convicted me very, very specifically one day with Romans 13, 1 to 2. Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers or the authorities, for there is no power or authority but of God. The powers that be or the authorities that exist are ordained of God. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power, resisteth the ordinance of God, and they that resist shall receive to themselves judgment. You know, and I got thinking, it was no surprise to God that he put me, when he put me at Bob Jones, that they had those rules. I mean, God didn't wake up from an afternoon nap one day and say, boy, I called Berg and I put him down there so he'd get right, but I forgot. They got some of those rules and he's not going to like that. I don't know what I'm going to do. That is not the way it happened with God. When he called me there, he knew exactly what he wanted me to do. And he wanted me to submit. And God crushed me with that passage. He has the power to change authority if he wants. Every U.S. president, every congressman, every senator, every government, uh, governor, every foreign prime minister, every tyrant, every terrorist is under the government of God. So I, I'm not sure I believe that. Then open your Old Testament and look at what he says about Pharaoh. Pharaoh is not a fundamentalist. And neither is Nebuchadnezzar. And Belshazzar, he doesn't fit in fundamental circles either. Cyrus, you know who ruled all those men? The king of heaven. He's the king of all the kings. And he's the lord of all the lords. And he's in complete control. And folks, that includes God's superintendence of our employers, of our pastors, of our fathers, of our husbands, of our school principals, of our school teachers, of our camp directors, of our room leaders in a residence hall. God runs all of them. And it's no surprise when he puts us someplace and we're, we're I mean, he's not thinking, oh no, what am I going to do? I put them there and I never thought about that. How that's going to work. He knows how it's going to work and that's why he put them there. I love what Alexander Carson said. He says, this is a, written in, in an old style, but get the gist of this. Why does folly often prevail over wisdom in the councils of princes and in the houses of legislators? God has appointed the rejection of good counsel. Did you know that? God appoints the rejection of good counsel in order to bring on nations that vengeance that their crimes call down from heaven. God rules the world by providence, not by miracle. See that grave has destined to punish the nation. Some prating speculatist will impose his sophism on the most sagacious assembly. You know what, God, you know what he just said there? You can have the wisest of senators stand up and say, folks, if we do this, it'll bring down our ruin for this, and it'll bring our ruin for this reason, and this reason, and this reason, and he may be entirely right and have it all correct. 
But if God is determined to bring on that nation the judgment they deserve, he'll let that man be overruled by some fool. God rules. And nations get what they deserve. That God has all power means that he possesses absolute right. The New Testament word for that is exousia. It denotes freedom of action. It means that he has the right, the freedom to do something. Used of God, it is absolute freedom, unrestricted. Used of men, of course, exousia, authority is delegated. We need to meditate on God's absolute control. God's control is absolute. If there is a single event in all of the universe that can occur outside of God's sovereign control, then we cannot trust him. I mean, if there's anything that's ever happened outside of his control, we can't trust him, folks. Say, well, you know, I've known some other people that didn't come through for me, but I still trust them now. Yeah, but they haven't been perfect in every way and promised perfection and promised to deliver like he's promised to deliver. If he messes up anything, we can't trust him in anything. I mean, we, if God messes up in anything, we have a situation like the Romans under their gods. We really don't know where, we're going to stand, where we stand and how this is all going to come out. But that's not going to happen. God is in absolute control over all things. God's control, however, is not always apparent. It may look like things are out of control, but they're not. He permits for reasons known only to himself for people to act contrary to and in defiance of his revealed will. But he never permits them to act contrary to his sovereign will. 1 Chronicles 29, 11 to 12 is where David had that, made that prayer. Thine, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the majesty. For all that is in the heaven and in the earth is thine. Thine is the kingdom, O Lord, and thou art exalted as head above all. Nehemiah 9, 6, thou, even thou, art Lord alone. Lord alone. Thou hast made heaven, the heaven of heavens with all their hosts, the earth and all the things that are therein, the seas and all that is therein, and thou preservest them all, and the host of heaven worshipeth thee. I mean, he's running it all. Psalm 103, 19, the Lord has set his throne in the heavens, and his kingdom ruleth over all. Revelation 19, 6, and I heard as it were the voice of a great multitude, and as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of mighty thundering, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent, all-powerful, reigneth. Aren't you glad the one who has all the power is the one who is in control, who is one running it all? Folks, it is that truth, God's power to fulfill everything he promised that was a stabilizing force for Abraham that's why he could go to the top of a mountain with a knife in his hand to slay his son because God had promised something and he didn't know how it was going to work out, but God wouldn't go back on his promise and God would have the power to raise his son from the dead if that's what it took, but God would not stop his promise. Now, folks, that's stability. Abraham isn't anxious saying, oh no, what if this happens and what if that happens and what if this happens and if only this and if only that and if only... He's not filled with that kind, of, that kind of thinking. Why? Because he knows the God who has promised and that he will do everything he said he would do. That's what sustained Moses. That's what sustained Esther. That's what sustained Ruth. That's what sustained Joseph. Joseph. Joseph is a wonderful testimony of God's power. God had come to this young man. I mean, this guy's raised in a dysfunctional family if there ever was one. He's got four moms. You think you had trouble with one. He has four moms all at once. Ten brothers who hate him. A spoiled sister and a doting father. That's about as dysfunctional as you can get. You know what the lesson of Joseph is? That your background and heredity doesn't have to ruin you. He had a pretty miserable background and a lot of bad breaks, if, you know, in the world's terms. You know what was behind all of that? The power of God to bring about something he promised Joseph. You know what he promised Joseph? That one day, sheaves would bow. Sun, moon, and stars would bow. And you know that was his stability because that hadn't happened yet. And someday it would. 
That was his staying power, that God had promised him something that hadn't happened yet. You know, here are his brothers. They sell him into slavery. And by selling him into slavery, make a whole lot of decisions for him. I mean, he's, he's 17 years old when this happens, about the time most guys like to be figuring out what they want to do with their life, and his brothers sell him into slavery and make a lot of decisions for him. Their, his brothers, by that decision, chose what he's going to major in. You know? I mean, he's studying to be prince heir of this clan because he's next in line as the, as the birthright was given to him because it was, it was uh, his, his, his firstborn brother messed up. And God gave Joseph the birthright. And so here he is. His brothers sell him into slavery, and he's, he's been training to be the prince heir of the clan. And now they sell him into slavery, and he's down in Egypt not doing this management major anymore that he was training to do. And by the way, when he got down into Egypt, he didn't start out in Potiphar's house. You know, if you're an Egyptian lord, you don't look over a slave block and say, you know, I think I'd like that guy to run my house. You have no idea what that guy's like. You buy that slave and you put him out in the field with the rest of the slaves and watch how he does. And Joseph doesn't say, apparently, he doesn't say, well, you can't expect me to do a good job for this guy. I didn't pick this, I didn't pick this job. I didn't pick this major. You know, I want to be a management major and, and I'm an agriculture major right now. You know, whatever he's doing out in the fields. Or they were building pyramids at that time. He could have been cutting sandstone blocks and rolling those on, on logs up pyramids. We don't know what he was doing, but he didn't start out in the house. But he had enough staying power because he knew God was powerful enough to bring about his promises. And Joseph had enough stability that he worked hard and his master noticed it and his master finally put him in the house. What gave Joseph that kind of stability? An awareness of the faithful God who could do what he said he would do. And then he finally gets in a decent position in that house and, and then there's, and talk, we talked today about sexual harassment in the workplace. Joseph had it. This woman is after him for a long time. The Hebrew word there, it, it depicts a long period of time where she is after him. And Joseph doesn't give in. And because he doesn't give in to that, he gets thrown into prison on false charges of attempted rape. What is his staying power there? There was still a promise that hadn't been fulfilled yet. And God had the power to do it, and God would. And he's down in that prison, and you know what? He, he's down there, and, and three guys, uh, two guys come to him, the baker and the, and the uh, butler, and they're, they're really sad. And Joseph walks in one day, and they're really sad. You know why I think Joseph, you know why I know Joseph's heart was so stable? Because when he came to work, he noticed the look on other people's faces. He saw they were sad. You know, if you're filled with your own problems and you're just fussing because you're down in this stinking hole in this prison and you shouldn't be here anyway and after all, I'm doing right. All I do is do right. I go and check on my brothers like my dad tells me to do and they sell me to slavery. And then I do right and I finally, and I finally get a decent job and I get in here and I'm still doing right and I'm, I'm trying to stay away from immorality and I do that and I get thrown into prison. What is, what's going on? He knew what was going on. The faithful God was working out a plan and he knew the end chapter, but he didn't know all the stuff in the middle. But it didn't matter because he knew how, what the end was going to be. And he comes to work calm because he notices the, the, the distress. On, and he says, tell me, tell me your problems. He doesn't say, man, I got problems of my own. Don't tell me your problems. You know? And he's not a cynic. They come to him and say, you know, we had dreams. And he says, oh, dreams. <laughs> <laughs> I've had some dreams. <laughs> you want to talk about dreams? Let's talk about dreams. Sheaves bowing. You know, does this look like sheaves are bowing to me? Sun and moon stars bowing. Does it look like that's happening to me? Listen, don't, don't worry about dreams. They don't work. You know? <laughs> Joseph's not a cynic, folks. He's stable. When everything has fallen apart in his life. Because there was a God who is powerful enough to bring about what he's promised. And Joseph says, tell me your dreams, and, and he interprets the dreams for him. And finally, one of the guys remembers it and brings him out when Pharaoh has a dream. Pharaoh brings him out. Joseph interprets those dreams. 
and the brothers come down to buy corn, and the sheaves start bowing. And you, you look at those passages, those sheaves bow a lot. And the sun, moon, and stars bow. And Joseph, in the Romans 8, 28 of the Old Testament, Genesis 50, 20, says to his brothers, in essence, you intended this for evil, but God meant it for good. Now, how can God take all of that kind of stuff and turn it for good? Because he's all-powerful. He can take... My, my daughter, my youngest daughter, is, is an artist. And I remember when she was just really young, she would take something and she'd start drawing it. And then she'd decide, I don't want it to be that. And I don't think it's pretty good. I, but she wasn't satisfied with that. And you know what she could do? She could make it into something else. I cannot believe how artists do that. They can take something that starts looking like a, you know, a house and before they end, end up, it looks like you know, a boat you know, or something. I, you know, the amazing creative ability. That's what God is like. He can take whatever is happening and that he's allowing and that he's bringing in our life and with his wisdom and his skill and his power make it into something when people stand back at the end and say, that is absolutely amazing. Now I look at that story of Joseph and I say, this is incredible. And you know what, folks? If you and I will spend any time looking at our own lives honestly and see what this great God has done for us, I look at what he's done for me and I say, this is amazing. There's only one person who can do this. This, this is God who does this. That gives me a lot of hope for a lot of the students I deal with. It really does. I mean, if he can turn me around, he can turn them around. God can do that and he's promised he will. He's a powerful, powerful God. Here's Abraham. Here's Moses. How could they have quiet souls? They could say, my soul can rest because God's power is more than enough for me. Folks, what does 2 Peter 1, 2 say again? Grace and peace be multiplied to you through the knowledge of God. Oh, take the time. Take an attribute of God and study it and find out what he's like. Let him burn it into your soul. We need to do that on a regular basis. Studying the attributes of this great God and what he's like. I encourage you, get some of A.W. Tozer's books. Get the knowledge of the holy, the attributes of God, the pursuit of God. There was a man who knew God. And he will give you a thirst for God as you study him. Study the attributes of God. He is more than enough for us.